I just need to get on right now with some of this other stuff and come back as we get a chance. So looking at IO activity, I've got OSV, OSV, gross view, and SAR. We're going to come back to SAR-B uh, this afternoon and into tomorrow. But B read and B write, maybe now is probably the best time to introduce this. data is going to exist in several places in the system, and that's what I'm drawing here, are all the stopover points that my data could be sitting in. So, somewhere in the program we've got our text piece, we've got our stack, and we've also got our data piece. So in the data piece, and again, this is the uh, this is the data piece right here. In there, we may define a array or a variable that could be static or dynamic. So that's the actual data that I'm defining with my language syntax, where it's going to exist in the program. Also in my program, and part of this data piece is the heap. We've got the heap that's growing this way, and the stack that's growing this way. And in this heap, when I do I.O., I get what's called a library buffer. So when I do a print, something like that, data is going to get buffered in this library. Buffered. It's contained within my heap, within my data portion of my program. Once the library routine, so there's a libc or a libf that's controlling the use of that library buffer when I do my reads and writes, at some point that libc is going to say, let's do a write. In this case, I'm writing. So this is user space and this is kernel space. And I now make a write system call to the kernel. That's going to get counted as a logical write, or if I go in the other direction, a logical read. In my kernel, then, I have my end buffs, my file system buffer cache. Coming out of buffer cache, then I present things to the XLV or XVM. Then that goes off to my disk. And I may have a cache on my disk as well. So when I'm moving data around in the system, it sits in my program, it sits in this library buffer, it may or may not sit in the kernel cache. There's actually going to be a, a SCSI and XIO and a CSI type of hardware path in there, but I'm not going to count those for and five. I'm not counting the hardware because it's completely transparent to me. I can't do anything to control the size of the buffers or anything like that on the SCSI or XIO boards. But these things I do have control over. I guess I should have marked uh, this one as a four, five, and a six. This isn't really a stopover point. This is kind of a transparent concept. 
So this is my fire bucket brigade. I'd like all these buckets to be a whole friendly number. The default number was 64 k byte for this one and 64 k byte for this one. Remember when we're setting up our sprite unit sizes, 64 k byte was the default. So anyways, going into cache, I've got logical reads and logical writes. Coming out of the back end of cache is a B read and a B write. So B reads and B writes are what's coming out of cache and being presented to the volume manager that's then going to convert it into the location of the drive if it was a volume set. If I bypass this, it is possible if I do an O underscore direct, to bypass that kernel cache, and that is called a P read or a P write. Okay. So B reads and B writes are coming out of cache. P reads and B writes are coming straight from user space, what we call direct I.O. So this SAR B is telling me what's being presented to the disks from the kernel and what's being presented to the disks from the users. For example, file system backups are going to do P reads and P writes, XFS dump, XFS restore. We have to do physical I.O. So L reads and L writes are what are being presented to the kernel. B reads, B writes, P reads, and P writes are what the kernel is doing with it. Most of our I.O. is going through cache and showing up as B reads and B writes. Now remember, par-s to track these. Par-k is what's trapping there. And within this cache is BD flush controlling some of those rights, the size of the rights that part dash k is going to show. So we're going to come back to this when we talk about buffer cache. We're going to talk about this fire bucket brigade. By the way, this library buffer we can control with two commands. In fact, there's email that passed the SNAP group this week. Set buff or assign allow me to control the size of that library buffer. I can even change it from a buffer to a cache. What's the difference between a buffer and a cache? Buffers are for writes, caches are for reads. The purpose of a buffer is to sectorize my data. The purpose of a buffer is to hold the data until it's a size that's friendly to the device that I'm writing to. Okay. So when we're buffering data, we're simply holding the data until it's worthwhile to write. So buffers are for writing. Caches are for reading and reuse. When you, when you write, you may not have a reuse, or you may. That's what we were talking about here. A read, read, write, read, read, write might be a reuse, but there's still a write in there. So if I'm going to go through a cache, I would like to reuse the data, even if I do buffer it and then read it twice and then buffer it or something like that. Now, I've been calling this thing file system buffer cache because it has three functions to it. File system metadata, delayed write buffer data, and read cache data. So the kernel is maintaining that three for three different reasons. The metadata, read data, and write data. So anyways, with the assign command, I can control this library buffer, and I can also bypass file system buffer cache and do direct I.O. All controlled with these two commands. Anyway, by looking at SAR-B, I'm seeing what kind of data is being presented to the disks, and whether it's direct I.O. or cached I.O. If I see all my I.O. as P reads and P writes, I want to go to the application. If I see all my I.O. as B reads and B writes, I need to go to my buffer cache configuration. And most of I.O. and IREX defaults through buffer cache. So before I go on to disks, I like to know is my data I.O. streams coming from the cache or coming from the users. If I'm striping, I would prefer it being coming from the users with direct I.O. 
Now, the next set of metrics they're listing here, I don't necessarily agree with. When I go to SAR-D, I like busy, and then the other two was the wait time and the service time. And I'm gonna actually go through that here in a few minutes. And then lastly, SAR-U, where we were looking at that wait I.O. time. We've used that a couple of times. So I'm gonna to try to actually go to a machine and take a look at these numbers and look at them. But that wait I.O., as we said yesterday, was five different statistics. The wait FS deals with the file system, the file system buffer cache. Whereas that PHY one was the bypassing of buffer cache. Okay. So if I see WFS high, and if the disk drives look okay with SAR-D, then I look at my file system buffer cache. Now here's something I'm going to reinforce later again. Always fix your file systems before you tune your cache. The cache has to eventually do I.O. So in your case, if 60 milliseconds was typical all the time, I could live with that, and then I would go back to the cache configuration. But he saw some two-second I.O. delays, and if those are happening all the time, I would try to deal with that before I dealt with the buffer cache issues. In other words, clean out your file system before you take care of your kernel cache configuration. So their example here is saying if weight I.O. is more than 10% and if weight F.S. is more than 50%, the system is limited really not by disk operations but by file system buffer cache. This is a problem. IRIX moves everything through cache. So this person that wrote this slide was thinking that if weight F.S. is high, my disks are slow. When in fact I could be simply running out of buffers. So I don't like that. Get rid of disk operations, and it's limited by my buffer cache. A couple other things to worry about. There's something called a directory name lookup cache. This is where all my directory name information is and all my metadata is. We can, we can look at that with PCP metrics, or we can configure it. And I'm going to talk about that when we talk about buffer cache. There's also a SAR-A option, which tells me how many inodes and directories I'm doing. In fact, I should have showed that earlier. SAR-A. Taking a little bit. There we are. Name I and I get. Name I says I resolved I had to resolve an inode. So name I is the kernel subroutine that says find me an inode. So for a while there we were in the 20 or 30 and all of a sudden we had 367 name I's that occurred. That might have even been related to what was happening with the load going on. Yeah, just kicked out the batch. Uh-huh. <clears throat> now, those are what are being resolved. If I can't find them in memory, I have to go to disk to get them. So an I get says I did not find it in name cache. I went to the disk area to find that particular inode information. So this directory name lookup cache, this DNLC, I can increase the size of it. And while we're here, we may as well just talk about this right now. This name cache has a floor and a ceiling. The ceiling is NC size. And the floor is called min buff mem. Now this is part of the buffer cache configuration. So this name cache is really a piece of what's called chunk cache, or the file system buffer cache. So with the directory tree structure, I can see how often am I going to get inodes from disks, and I can increase the size of my name cache and reduce the disk seeking, reduce this, the disk check for the, that actual inode to bring it back into memory. Now what kind of a market do you think you, you would want to have that ability? High metadata environments, news servers and mail servers. Okay. When I connect to a news server, every inode out there is a news article. So I need to pull in all those inodes to be able to put together my topic list and stuff like that. So on a new server and mail server where I have lots of inodes that I'm always going for, increasing the size of that directory name 
the lookup cache is often done. Okay, so if I'm handling mail servers, I want to increase that, and then I can hold more metadata within my buffer cache. Now, NBuff was the ceiling for the whole cache. But this was my metadata. Then I have my clean data, my dirty data, and also what's called inactive data. Free C. Now, I'm going to come back to that later. So in a lot of sites, I'm seeing weight I.O. high and weight F.S. high. The disk drives look okay, and that's when I have to look at buffer cache. So anyways, just going on with SAR-D, we've got busy, we've got Q, we've got weight. They're saying here, if percent busy is greater than 85%, you probably have a problem. I like to see busy less than 20%. The second one says Q length greater than four. I don't really care what the Q length is as long as I don't have to wait. But if my average wait time, they're going 100 milliseconds, I prefer 40 milliseconds. That's the number that I would prefer. If my wait time is greater than 40 milliseconds, I'd like to do something about it. Now Warren was reporting a 2,000 millisecond IO wait time, but I don't know how often that's occurring. That was an average. Several days. Uh huh. Okay. Because the other day we were only seeing 60. So in that case, I'd have to identify what application was doing the I/O and make sure it's running when I'm looking at those two. I've got to be on the system when I'm getting those two two second waits or more. I've gone through the slides of the workbook. What I want to do is spend about 15 minutes and look at a system. And then we'll take our lunch break. And when you come back from lunch, you can try it again. So I'm going to log into Fido.inger. This is a new server. So I wanted to pick this one because it is a production environment that is actively being used and it's important. And I'm going to log in as guest. Now, if you, if you, you're going to have trouble following me because we may end up stepping on each other if we're both running SPV as guest. So I'm just going to see if SPV is on the system. And I put it there earlier, so I'm not sure if I modified this SPV to allow us all to run at the same time. So in my tuning process, my first question would be, what do I have for a system? So I'm going to do a quick inventory so that I can find things from within my tool, like file system layouts and stuff like that. And hopefully I'm not doing fragmentation metrics. just finishing up now, it's doing the show files. This system, if I tried to generate fragmentation metrics, it's so busy that the fragmentation counter will take a long time. Load average is only 1.4. What's the question? Load average is only 1.7. Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to do. So my inventory is gone. I just wanted to double check to make sure I wasn't doing fragmentation counts. That's what comes under verbose. And I had a bug for a while where the basic was calling fragmentation metrics and I didn't want that. So now I can view my configuration. So FIDO is running, it's a 6510 alpha. 6510. It's a four CPU, 200 megahertz challenge IP19 modules. And then I've got a whole bunch of disks on it. And memory was 896. Go over here. So what I'm trying to do right now is characterize this machine. Now I know the design in new server already. That's my politics for the machine. So 
Fido.Inger. It's an INN news server. It's four CPUs. Uh, it's an IP19 challenge, 200 megahertz. And these were what kind of chip? R4K, R4400. Memory was uh, 896 megabytes of memory, not NUMA. And then I could go in and count all my disk drives. Looks like three, four, three, four, four. Looks like about 16, 17 drives there. Now there's the SysTune report. And on this machine, they have used SysTune and they've modified a couple of things. They've turned off packet forwarding. IP forwarding is set to zero. That way we don't become a router. They've also upped max up to 1,000, 1,000 processes per user. And on this machine, they've upped NBuff. Now they've picked in 114688. They've also increased NCRs. Number of open file limits was also up to 1,000. They turned off KMM do poison. And then their NC size has also been increased because this is a metadata intensive machine. Okay, it's going to, with the new server, we're going to have a lot of metadata there. And we'll come back to min free pages, which they changed. They also increased min buff mem. So NC size and min buff mem for my metadata had been upped on this machine because metadata is very important. And then they've also modified VD flush activity and my paging activity. I don't really care about that right now. So I got check config, my swap, I have two swap slices, and I do have swap on allocated on those devices. Okay, so one looks like it's got about uh, 80, about 40 meg on one and maybe two meg on the other. So dev swap unfortunately is a lower priority. I now have a recommendation for this. Uh, administrator to switch priorities so that we swap the var swap file before we swap the root. I've got PS, I've got buff view, we'll take a look at that later. My versions. Okay. Now, go back. Dev swap was a raw partition on the disk of protection zero, whereas var swap file was an actual file. file correct. In the file system. Yes. So which one I would assume that var swap file would be slower access than the other one. Not really and not necessarily. Okay. Dev swap, like you said, is a raw slice. Swap files do direct I.O. rather than cached I.O. They have a different type of I.O. that they're doing. So you just take the space and so I'll get it on this and then get it right. Correct. So I'm not shuffling it through. The, the kernel doesn't have to monkey with it as much. So, uh, really, I'm not talking so much about performance, but what I'm saying is that the I.O. paths that they use are different. The hooks and the locks that they're using in the kernel are different. So if I don't have any uh, raw I.O. in my system or direct I.O. in my system and I throw on a swap file and I start doing I.O. to it, it will show up as a p-read and a p-write. I have to be careful here because the release levels have changed this and I have to get corrected because some have did and some have didn't. But basically, a swap file was going through the path that got counted as a p-read and p-write. And raw swaps did not get, oh, for a while they were being counted as p-reads and p-writes, but now they're not. So these counters have changed. That's what bothered me when I was looking at some of the other data. The only reason they did it as a swap file is convenience. And I generally would not strike swap again. If that's a swap file system, that's probably not going to help me. But what I was complaining about is that that swap is at a lower priority, and therefore we're going to swap to that first before we swap to the swap file. 
So I, I've got a quick inventory information, and already during the inventory, I have a recommendation to switch priorities. Okay. I'm going to save that off, and now I'll go back to SAR. We can see INND is running there. A few other things. I can see SAR just ran. On this system, I should still have a month's worth of data. Ouch. <laughs> Let's see. That was last month. This looks like today's what, the 19th? Yep. This tool is wrapping. So, cron events for today are going on to the 19th, but the 20th from last month is still there. So, I've gone through all the SAR files that are on the system and between the 19th and the 20th is where we are today. So this was last month from the 20th to about the 30th. And then this is this month. In fact, this event ended uh, around noon on October 2nd. So I have a month's worth of data here for the last month, from October 19th to September 19th. And I can start to see some trends. First of all, my CPU utilization normally, and we've got prime, non-prime going on here too, but my CPU utilization normally is between 16 and 20 percent. And in non-prime, it's between 6 and 8 percent. And then riding on top of that is my system time. And there was one event here for one day where my system time was really, really high. Looks like about uh, 60 or 70 percent system time in there. And then riding on top of that is my blue, which is my weight I.O. Now, two years ago, when I started tuning the system or making the recommendations, the blue was a straight line across the top. It was always I.O. bound. And we may mostly changed file system buffer cache and also did some minor disk changes. So I'm characterizing it. My CPU utilization is not at 100%. I did have an unusual event there, but the event is not occurring on my machine right now. My CPU utilization is in the 4 to 5%. So whatever was going on during the past month is not occurring anymore. So ever since the 2nd to the 19th, the machine has been behaving okay. Okay. So there's my system time. That's kind of interesting. I thought I'd see that. Oh, it was user time that I was seeing go high. So there's that one system time that we saw go high. And these are cron events. You can see a cron event pattern in there. If we actually drill down into it, it's occurring in the middle of the morning, about uh, 4 in the morning it looks like, that this cron event is occurring. That looks like 0.25 or 0.3. So every day there is a cron event running. And if I have a cron tab, I can find out that this is probably a, a script called expire purpose of the expire is to scrub all your old news articles so that I don't fill up my file systems. So once a day we typically run that cron event. Now, I'm not going to tune for that. I would pick a particular day and then look at that particular day. So here's one to two right here. And most of the time my system time is in the six or seven percent range. And that is where I am right now, nine to thirteen, eleven same approximate range. A uh, waste of time, a little bit of interrupt handler down at the bottom. Not too bad though, 2 to 3 percent. Increasing network socket buffer sizes can reduce my interrupts in network bound markets. So I don't get as many network interrupts to bring lots of little pieces. So upping the network buffer size allows me to bring in a bigger chunk. And I don't see any S-break weights going on on the system. And lastly, my weight I.O. time. There are some physical I.O.s, but most of the time it's blue, and the blue is my file system buffer cache. Okay. There are some greens in there, which are direct I.O., which could include file system backups or something like that, but I'm not going to worry about those. And also, down at the bottom is that trickle swap that I talked about. 
So this server has oversubscribed memory and we have some swapping going on less than 1% of the time. So what happened was there was a memory shortage event that occurred right here probably about the 4th. And ever since, I've had pages sitting out on swap that I have to bring in. In fact, let's just see if we've got that going on right now. SAR-W, one space 20. Not swapping, but we're going to see a, a trickle swap probably happen here in a minute or two. And that's what we're seeing with that prior display. The window's off the bottom of the page there. Well, I'm not seeing anything. Let's do a SAR-W for the day. So there is a little bit of trickle that just didn't occur within that uh, 40 seconds or whatever I did. But we still have some trickle swappings going on. Anyways, let me go to memory. I'm going to skip memory left and just talk about memory utilization. And then we'll take a break and come back from the break and look at the disk on the system. Okay, this is a bug. The kernel is exporting a bad number occasionally. Gross view PCP show the same problem. I'm going to get rid of the uh, noise. And there's the actual data. The kernel is exporting instead of a negative number, a super large number. So my kernel's down here doing about 10,000 pages. My cache is going between 40 and 50,000 pages, and right up here is my user space. I basically have this machine topped off. Unfortunately, this noise is in there making it hard. Did I get any other charts here? No. Yeah. I'm not sure why. Got a few problems found with input data. Some bad numbers. There we go. I got two charts that time. This tool is having a problem right now. It's not showing me everything. But every other tool is going to have that same problem where suddenly numbers come out in the 4.3 range, 4.2.9 range. So here are my two memory charts. This one, the black line, is what I physically have on my system, physical memory. Out of that physical memory, the blue is my kernel. The red is my kernel plus my cache. So my kernel and cache are taking maybe 60% of my memory. And there are cases where my kernel cache is growing all the way up to about 80% of my memory. And then running on top of that is my user applications. And that's topping me off in percentage, I don't know, somewhere around 80-85%. So VHAND is trying to keep that much memory free. So this is what uh, we were talking about earlier. I have a machine with free memory, but I still have swapping going on. Now, the red is what my kernel size is, and over on the right, that kernel size then is broken out between the kernel, the metadata, and the dirty data. Now, I should have also had a couple other parameters here. I'm just going to put a new SPV on the script to try it. But it should have also had clean data and a few other metrics. So it's showing that, in this case, most of my cache is file system control data or metadata because the red is kind of buried under here but the red is what's underneath that. So most of this memory is being used by metadata. Now I can confirm that with buff view. If 
Now since this is a buffer bound system, buff view will take longer to run. LS, PWDs, those would run fine. But buff view is very busy right now. There we are. So on this system I've configured 114,000 buffers. 88,000 of them are being used by metadata right now. In fact, 85,629 are for the news file system. So that's all the I know is for all the news articles that are being handled by the news server. And everyone else is very small, 800 for VAR, 400 for WWW, and everyone else is way, way down there in size. Now when I first got to this machine, BuffView was the first time that I actually used BuffView on a machine that was buffer cache bound. And what you could see was basically this dot .overview file and the metadata toggle back and forth in the list. There wasn't enough space to hold both. So every time we hit the overview file, it would come into memory and squeeze the metadata out. And then I'd have to hit the metadata, and that would go up. So I'd see the news and another file go back and forth in the list as my program would hit the metadata and then go to the history file that it was working with and then go back to the metadata. Then on this machine, when I looked at the busy flag with an F option, ESY, I would then be able to see what the busy things were. And what I would see then in this example was it hit all the inodes. Okay, right now we've got inodes in the news file system. Actually, it's not inodes, allocation group and other metadata. Now let's see what else hits it. Now this machine is behaving fairly well right now. That's still metadata for the news file system. Now when I, this machine was bad, there's an inode map allocation group. I'd see the file, the history file, fill the whole page. And then I'd see all the inodes fill the whole page. Okay, we still don't have any real, there was one inode that we referenced. Okay. So what had happened on this machine was the expire script had stopped, the history file had gotten large, the file system had gotten real full, and all this metadata was thrashing my file system buffer cache. In other words, I was spending more time thrashing data here than the references that I'm doing on this side. It's what I call an upside down cache. Okay. The purpose of a cache is to reuse data here. I don't want to have higher physical than logical. And I'm not seeing too many problems here right now. Let's see a SAR, one space 15. My weight I.O. time is in the 24% range. There, now it's down to 7, 25%. And all of the time, there was, a, there was one of those trickle swaps that just occurred. But all the rest of the time, it's all waiting on file system buffer cache. Okay. So here was a 75% of the time during that interval, all of it was waiting on buffer cache. Now, I'm going to do one command, and then we'll take our lunch break. SAR D. I'm going to also view this with SPV when we come back from lunch, but I just wanted to profile things. Let me do a SAR D once this one. That's good enough. So I'm just trying to get my labels. So the first field is the name of the device. Second field is how busy is the drive. So when I'm looking at disk, I start off with the average for the day, and I'd like to see several days as well. I then pick out the drives that have bad numbers. Now obviously there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine drives here that have nothing on them at all today. Two drives, three drives that are big in busies. Maybe I should write that down over here. I've got S0D4, which was 20% busy. And I've got S7D5, which was 30% busy. And I also have S6D2, which was 57% busy. 
Okay. So that to me is the first number I'm looking at. How busy is it? So I've got one, two, three drives that are above my threshold. And I said my threshold was like 20%. If I've got a drive that's over 20% busy, I want to look at it. And I picked 20 here because it was now 20. If it were at 18 or something, I might have still picked it out because it was way above these. But if it was 9 or 10, I would have ignored it. So I basically picked my top three busy drives. Now, I don't care about the queues, the reads and writes, the number of blocks, writes per second, or number of blocks written. All that data is going to be load dependent. But what I care about is how long did it take to do the I.O. and how long did I wait? Now, other people will be using these other metrics, but I'm saying post-analysis, I want to get down to the, the bad drives. So again, I have a different drive that's coming up here, S1D5. Now the busy on S1 D5 was 1%. But the IO wait time was four seconds, four and a half seconds. And that's average for the day. Okay. If I look at S0 D4, that's at 193. What else do I have? There's a S0 D5. It's also at 577. And then uh, S75, 146, and 125. So I now have one, two, three, four, five drives that concern me. Out of 16 some drives, five drives are taking all the load. Of course, I'd ask, well, can I use these drives? It looks like they've added a uh, rate cap or something like that in there. But in any event, could we take advantage of these drives and spread some of this I.O. across all of these other drives? Now here was my rule of thumb. I want service plus weight added together to be less than 40 milliseconds. So some of these are borderline and I don't care about them. Warren, we were seeing 60, so I kind of left those alone. So here's one that's at 40. But again, I'm just picking the top one. So I've got one, two, three, four, five drives that have long weights to them. And I'm ignoring these just because I can't do with every drive there. So I'm ignoring the 36, 67, 15, and 34. But the two added together, I like to have less than 40 milliseconds. Okay, but since several of them go above that, I'm just going to pick the top ones. What would I do now? Let's see if it's on the system. What's on them? So I'm going to do a DK map. B store would have been helpful too. A DK map. So S zero D four. See bunch that aren't configured yet. S zero D four right there. Four. Okay. This is why during the inventory process, I'd like to get this ahead of time so I don't have to call the customer back and say how are things laid out. So S0D4 was slash bar, which also included the bar swap file. Not that that's relevant. This was 20% busy, 193, that was borderline. S7D5, bar spool news. Yeah, bar spool news. And S62, bars, bars, mm -hmm. news again. And you'll note that they're showing what looks like uh, strike. And the third one was S75. We got that one already. S1D5, maybe? S1D5 was the one we missed. Which one is that? S1D5 is bar www. S0D5. And then S0D5. Bar www. Yeah. So now I've got politics in mind here, too. Do I care about the web server? What's the web server doing on this particular machine? In this case, I'm not going to care about it. I'm only going to care about bar spool news. 
the Barstool News is my bread and butter. That's what I know about INN. So I had S1B3 was not in this list. But S75 and S62 were. There should be another one. There it is. S0D2, did I get that one? S0D2. So what I'd be interested in doing now is looking at those four drives and see how they are behaving as a file system because that's my bread and butter file system. That's the important file system for this particular application. I would ignore the uh, web server stuff. So this one that had a 570 second wait on an I.O. request, I'm not going to pay attention to unless the web server is important to me. So Varspool News isn't too bad, except for the busies. Uh, let me go back for a second. What was S1D3, now that we know the, the other parts of the file system? S1D3, 40. 40. What do you mean? Oh, adding those two together. But that's still borderline. And the other one was S0D2. That's roughly the same. And the same borderline, about 48. Okay. Now, I want to take a break here, but one of the things that I tell people. I want these two to be under 40 milliseconds, but if these are borderline and this is high, I look for extra head movement. Too many partitions to a drive or too much fragmentation. In this case, S62 is probably where a lot of my metadata is and I'm spending a lot of head time movement. That drive is busy getting to the data because the movement doesn't seem to show up in these two metrics. Okay, so here's an example. These two, at, look at this one's lower busyness, but higher service plus weight. This one is lower, so it's uh, 54, 68 versus 90, but it's almost twice the busyness of the drive. So when I have drives that look tolerable here, but are way out of range here, I want to find out what they're doing. Note also, though, we've got twice on that particular metric. Which one was that? The right blocks. Let's double check that. That was just total blocks. And most of it was 382, which was the right blocks. Okay, so that tells me that that drive, majority of that drive is busy with rights. 58% of the time is busy doing something in these service times and wait times added together are that. So the fact that it's writing and the extra head movement associated with it can bring this percentage up higher. Also if I had too many partitions on the drive that would be another thing that I'd look for. And we really need to take our lunch break. <laughs> So when we come back from lunch, I'm just going to look a little bit more at this machine with SAR-D and uh, get on to CPU scheduling, and then we'll come back to buffer cache. I'm assuming that it's more running codes 1 and 3 or something. Let's go back to FIDO, though.
we were looking at a, a new server, FIDO. We've gone through CPU, we've looked a little bit at the memory. We'll come back to swapping and stuff like that. And where we were was looking at the disk drives. So that's what I was going to do next. Now before break, I went to the average to figure out what drives I care about. Right now, I'm going to get every drive on the system, and a lot of them I may not care about. So before I actually went to the uh, details like this, I wanted to get the big picture again with the averages at the end of the day. Now with uh, SPV, if you want to look at a particular, oops, there's that same, getting some problems there. Doesn't look like I got any disk data out of it. I do have the ability of uh, specifying a particular disk drive that I want to look at. So right here in this middle under setup, I could put in a particular drive. Now since that blew up, I'm just going to exit. I'm going to try the other SPV that was on the system. So characterizing FIDO.Inger, the CPUs were not oversubscribed. There was an event during the uh, month where we had high user time, and there was an event where we had high system time, but in general, CPUs were not the problem. Then we looked at memory. Memory was topped off. All of our memory was being used, and in fact, we saw swapping going on. So there is some memory contention on the system. And that's where we left off, was looking at I.O. on the system. I'm still trying to see if I can get the disk one to work. I've had problems a couple of times this week with the disk one, so I'm not sure what's changed. Some of it's the newer device names. They now the newer device names are real long character strings. By the way, that's something to consider. There is with uh, SAR. A new option, capital D, capital F. Capital D says ignore the idle disks. And a capital F puts the uh, fi fabric device, fiber channel type device names that have long names, but they make them over on the right. So it causes the device name to be printed on the right rather than on the left. I've been thinking about switching over to that to resolve some of these. Uh, uh, long name problems I've been having. So anyways, I'm going to have to look at a difference between the SPV script I just put on the system versus this SPV script, because this one worked. So now I am again looking at the other day, or this was just average for today. I logged in and looked at today. But now I'm looking at a whole month again. So riding on top of all this, I've got one drive Again, I probably would not be concerned. Notice that these are so periodic, they're cron events. I probably would not be tuning or dealing with that particular event. But that one happens to be S62. S62 was our bar spool news. So those high busies, and it, it is riding up here all the time, anywhere between 35 and 90% busy. So that would be one drive that I would want to look at more closely. And then the other two drives was this dotted one, which was S0D2. And S0D2 was part of our spoon news as well. And then the third one was a dark blue here. Looks like it's S0D4. And S0D4 was a different file system, but that was slash R. The rest of these drives are under the 20% mark. Here's my 20% mark. So I really have two or three drives, and the two drives that are busy all the time are my important file systems. And then I've got all these empty drives that aren't taking any load at all. So it would be nice to find a way to get more drives involved in that file system. Now, we didn't actually check to see how full that file system is either. 
come back to that in a minute. So I want to keep my busies less than 20%. I got two drives that stand up for that, and I picked out three before because there was one as, as a borderline at 20%. Now my service times are typically between 10 and 20 milliseconds. So SAR-D, this was the far right metric. I do have one drive here, it looks like S4D3, that is getting high service times. And S4D3 is not on my list of important drives, so I'm gonna leave that one alone. And the rest of the drives are in that 10 to 20 millisecond range. So ignoring the one outlier drive, there's actually a second one in here as well, S0D2, which was part of our VAR spool nudes. So these uh, dotted blue lines here are part of the uh, VAR spool nudes file system. But everything else is anywhere between 8 and 20 milliseconds, except for those two outliers. You see a little bit of green here as well, S1D1 but that's not part of my important file systems. So I do still have one drive, S0D5, and that one was var www. And that was the one that had the high wait times too, 572 seconds of wait time. So I'm kind of putting together what I saw for an average with what I'm seeing in the, in the trends here. The wait times, now we can start to see some of the different events. And note the wait times are very periodically spaced again. So again, this has to do with some sort of cron event that would be going on that does this so, so evenly spaced. But we're getting up to 16 second waits. There are two drives visible in here, S6D1 it looks like. Oh, actually, I think that's S1D5. And S1D5 was var www. else could have. The other one was a red one. The red one looks like S0D5 and that was VAR WWW. So that VAR WWW is this red one here. And it's kind of interesting to me. I see red and then I see the other one red and the other one is kind of rotating every other day for some reason. And that it might be helpful for me to know cron events and is that every